Well, while wind energy is good for Oklahoma, it may not be so good for Oklahoma wildlife. The Oklahoma Nature Conservancy works to strike a balance between the needs of wildlife and the needs of man. Earlier, our Lisa Hines visited with Mike Fuhrer, State Director of Oklahoma's Nature Conservancy, to find out how they're working with wind farms to ensure Oklahoma's wildlife can coexist with Oklahoma's energy future. Conservation's on everybody's mind, and wind seems to be a green conservation energy source, but there's still some issues there that people may not understand. That's right. Um, you know, you hear a lot about wind energy and that it's moving forward. There's a lot of development. Um, and you know what we're recognizing is that uh, sometimes these wind farms can be sited in inappropriate places. They can uh, really destroy or fragment really important uh, remaining prairie habitat. Uh, and so we've been working with the uh, utility industry and the energy industry that's developing these wind farms to uh, just get that message up because really uh, most people uh, didn't know that that was even an issue. And uh, so far there's been a really good response to uh, our efforts uh, to help provide the information, help them avoid those really sensitive areas. But what are the options out there? I mean, the wind is where the wind is. So how do you work around where these habitat areas are? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, the first thing that we did was uh, develop a map that puts on the map the places with the highest wind potential. That's what the uh, uh, wind companies are using to determine where they're gonna put their wind farms. We then overlaid on top of that uh, locations of some of that really sensitive habitat that we know is out there from uh, our planning. When you start to see where those places overlap, you start to learn where uh, those sensitive areas are that have high wind potential, and those are the ones that, uh, uh, if possible, we'd like to uh, avoid. You also see those other areas where there is no overlap, where the habitat's already been dramatically changed or fragmented. Uh, they still have a high wind potential, uh, but they're not going to have any major uh, habitat or conservation impacts if wind is developed there. So that's what we're trying to do, is just identify those places where wind can be developed and uh, at the same time avoid those real sensitive places. What else do we need to know about conservation and wind? Well, I think uh, one of the more interesting parts uh, about wind is that uh, it's more than just uh, habitat fragmentation or destruction. And habitat fragmentation is uh, taking, you know, the once vast prairie and slowly cutting it up into smaller and smaller pieces over time. Um, you know, there's a lot of what we call prairie obligate species that require real vast uh, open uh, prairie to survive. You know, bison is a really good example. They used to uh, number in the, the millions, something somewhere around 50 or 60 million animals, and they used the vast open uh, prairie, which was somewhere around 100 million acres in the United States. Uh, and slowly that's been fragmented, and, and uh, of course we don't have bison roaming free uh, anymore, but there's other species like the lesser prairie chicken. They do require vast open uh, prairie, and the more we fragment that land, uh, a bigger problem it is for them. At the same time, one of the things we're just starting to understand now is their behavioral response to the tall wind towers. These things are, you know, 300 plus feet tall, and uh, these uh, prairie birds, like the, the prairie chicken, you know, they evolved over time to avoid uh, tall structures in the prairie, trees, individual trees, other things, because uh, the theory goes that's where raptors, uh, hawks and eagles would roost and look for their prey, the prairie chicken. And so they avoid these areas. And there's research that shows that uh, um, habitat, even if it looks good to you and me, you know, within a mile or more uh, uh, radius around these towers, uh, will be unusable for birds like prairie chicken. So not only do you, you know, destroy a small part of the habitat, but then you render a lot of other habitat useless for many of these important uh, bird species. So we're starting to understand more and more the more subtle effects like that of wind energy placement. And so that again goes into the whole uh, uh, way we're trying to help site wind in the, the most appropriate places. How are they affecting other animal types? Well, uh, there's also been some issues uh, discussed uh, or investigated regarding bats. Uh, there was a study just uh, released recently that showed that bats that fly in close proximity to the moving blades actually are killed because of the dramatic pressure change. It causes their, their lungs to uh, essentially explode. Um, and so there's probably ways to design uh, the wind turbines so that uh, they don't cause these kind of problems, but uh, we're starting to learn more and more about those uh, types of issues that we just don't know about. Um, initially, also there was a lot of concern about uh, uh, collisions with birds. Uh, that's becoming uh, less of an issue in places like uh, Oklahoma, uh, but in some real important migratory corridors for uh, migratory birds, uh, that can be an issue. And we've seen that uh, on places like California where there's, there are these really important flyways. 
uh, and then you can have uh, collision issues. So there's a lot of more subtle issues along with uh, some of the more obvious big issues like habitat destruction and fragmentation.